Hello and most welcome to 1027. We are presently experiencing a little drizzle here. We are um, at the local church in Bramargården and we have this absolutely beautiful blood oak in front of us. You see it's all green and lush and these are one of the things that I often point out to people that the colors are much nicer when it's clouded. Most people seem to sort of unthinkingly assume that the colors must, must be much better when it's sunshine. And that is actually an oversimplification mix, mixing to different things, the pleasure from sunshine and the visual experience. I think that's very peculiar to the West. It is absolutely stunning when it's clouded and you don't get an inkling of this when the sun is out. The sun takes away colors, obviously, in some way, just like it bleaches color. So that is a sort of an affordance that looking in deeper into what affordances are we can realize different things how they work and what is the interaction instead of these simplifications and sort of first takes that blocks out further development so today's lecture is going to be a recap what i've done before sort of an explanation in my own way or what we managed to gather and the progress that is made. Let's see if I can stabilize the whole thing here. And I will make Short lecture here first, well, short-ish, about quantum mechanics, James Day Gibson, and what sort of opening for thinking that could be reached, achieved, become possible with this sort of a advancement in thinking. Let me get on, get on to it. Quantum mechanics show that we are coupled to the environment. And this is also a great hint to go further. James J. Gibson is, in my opinion, one of the greatest propon proponents in showing that we can learn from this coupling and how that in its turn can inform all we think and do. So the name of the lecture is that Gibson's theory of affordances is not a theory in regular fashion. fashion. It's not what one could call a sort of an ideological stance contra other well-established lines of thinking. I mentioned this previously uh, in the lecture series around 300, how Tony Shimero opened up the idea of oppositions in discussions and that one theory should be in contrast to another one and that they should fight and there is a winner. Gibson's theory of affordances is a rather slower look, I, I'm calling it here, at the things that we are already using, the things that we have around us. 
and how an understanding could improve what we are already engaged in doing. One could say that, in a way, affordances do not add anything to what we already have. It is not a clear line to be followed or believed. Rather, it goes into the theory and shows how that theory could be better used. It goes in from the inside, not from the outside, so to speak. I think that is well put. So Gibson's, the Gibsonian take on reality is not to go on the outside, it's rather to go on the inside. In order to better be able to handle that specific theory or other theories in Concord. So it's not out to create a polarity or gaining. It is not the Hegelian thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is radically different, I'd say. And it takes some time to get used to. One could call it an invitation to investigate in order to find out more. According to present theories of mind and also present theories of matter, the theory of affordances does not take a stance according to this, doesn't put itself in opposition or it doesn't give a thumbs up to them either. It is not working like that at all. It is rather trying to find out more, looking into matters, investigating. And there is a goal in the sense of not so much contradiction or contradicing, argumenting, but is rather a goal of making things to work better. And by doing so, we get better at what we are already doing. And this is one of the telos, this is the goal of affordances. It's, one could say, it is its justification. Why do I do this? Well, the justification is you're getting better at what you are doing. Whereas it could be tough to justify an argumentative theory with anything more that it's truer or something like that. Here, the idea of improvement is built into the very idea from the beginning. It is not a side effect, it's the goal. The question could be put, how do we improve what we are already doing? How can we learn better in our daily life? And by understanding things in relation, how could this clearer understanding of you, so to speak, or functioning, help us? And you will learn later how the actual theory of affordances is formulated makes it nay, no, impossible not to develop once you get into it. And the very same thing holds to a certain extent true for quantum mechanics. It was a way of making things work better. 
It's catchword war for a while. Calculate, don't think or theorize, do things. Do not always speculate, one could, may, might, perhaps. Simplify it. What quantum mechanics did was to make things run smoother and better. It made things like time and space clearer. It showed that we didn't have a universal concept of time and space. We didn't share those concepts. We haven't looked into those things carefully. Well, you all know that Newton did not. So it could be called for seeing how we use things, like looking at the object you have in front of me or you. How could this come to a better use? It's as easy as that. It's like looking at this thermos. You could use it directly as a drinking tool. Something my esteemed colleague, Kalle, showed me. You can drink directly from it if the coffee is not too hot. That's looking at its use. It doesn't take a stance, prove the thermos, says the thermos is good or true, and neither is it attacking the thermos and saying, oh, the thermos is wrong, it's false. <laughs> it is about how we use things rather than a theory of how things are used. And, of course, theory need to generalize much more to become a theory, and in this case we don't find so many generalities as a more of an open investigation. Looking into how could the thermos be used doesn't really apply to trying to climb this blood oak could be other things those two things have in common and that I will get back to in a later lecture it has to do with the rules of reality might be very other very different from what we usually presume rules to be but they can still be rules like certain things certainties do know this for a fact chilly here. Mm. In quantum mechanics one looked into T like time and space more carefully I realized we use these things in a most more different way than we assumed and we could further that sort of coupling between ourselves and the expressions the concepts they became richer more working less problematic and less mysterious and this is how science benefit human beings. It is not merely questioning the old theory. It's a benefit. It's beneficial. It's benevolent. It's good. It's sheer goodness. It wouldn't be just or wouldn't even make sense that some part of physics would not be helped by knowing more about things. This is how it is with the affordances. They always imply getting more knowledge. And they all work within the present theories. You don't need to negate them necessarily. Could do, but that's not part of what is supposed to be done. That's not the telos. Improvement is the telos. Getting better in understanding. Understanding the coupling between what we think and what we do. 
and how things in the world can be constructed in a way that is definite, but not definite in a sort of a general sense, in the definiteness of being an object, a definiteness that is not definiteness. Go around saying objects doesn't make any sense, and this is exactly the point of Orgebor. And this you need to understand. And that, the only way of doing that understanding is to really think about these things and see how they are used. It's not a counter-argument to anything. When Arge Bohr said it was not a counter-argument, it was not, don't do this. It was more of showing what you can do. Not stopping too early, not taking your calculator and pen and put it to the side, I won't do anything more. It's more of that. It was learn more. We are benefited by understanding more about scale, time and space. It's a deepening. And this deepening doesn't have to take the format of a theory in the old-fashioned way of having an argument at uh, these different points that are attacked and so on and so on. It's actually very has more in common with how deconstruction works, at least the quality of deconstruction. Good deconstruction doesn't change anything in a book, nothing, zero, zilch. But it's still very helpful. And the same is we have affordance, it doesn't establish anything. It doesn't establish anything, but on the other hand, it doesn't take anything away. It's another process altogether. It's a little bit like making a thermos rather than talking about it. It's on a different scale, so to speak, or in a different area and with a different objective. Yes, some people pointed out, when we look further, the separation between mind and body could diminish. Well, yeah, it could be like that, but that's not the goal of a thought and theory. It doesn't claim to cut the cut, so to speak. It doesn't want to take the cut away, neither want it, does it want to preserve it. It says only look into it more carefully and see how you using those things yourself. Isn't that a bit more Gibsonian? Yeah, I would think so. See how you use it yourself in your everyday life. There's a second take here and might help here. There's something called top to bottom. Think about theory that has a sort of a top to it. And of course we all agree the top is the most important. This is where the argument comes. And then you can look into the finer details of the theory. But you have like a big take on the theory first. Maybe you read for 10 minutes, 15 minutes and you get the theory. And then you can sort of delic delicately go into the details. But once you got the general vision of the theory, it is clarification that is done, specification, and you go from top to bottom. This we mentioned before. This is the scale invariance that we discovered in quantum mechanics. It goes for this as well. Well, of course it does. And that means that things at the bottom change the whole concept. Not because they add together or neither because they signal the theory should be changed. But going into finer details in fractality, for instance, and also the de deconstruction changes the big picture. So it's no longer top to bottom. 
And this is not an argument against reductionism. It shows that reductionism is working in another way than the reductionists themselves are thinking. Isn't that interesting? I think that's incredibly interesting. What do we do when we reduce? It doesn't say, let's stop reductionism. It doesn't say like the homepage uh, dualism now or whatever it's called. Stop reductionism and so forth. No, affordance theory doesn't say that at all. It is, as I hinted to earlier on, very, very different. But as this difference make it a very helpful to like deconstruction, affordance theory could be an immensely helpful thing for anyone. Anyone. One shouldn't say its main claim is against dualism or against non-dualism, although a first sketch of the whole thing is possibly against dualism in some way. But that needs to be just a first assumption without going too deep so you don't make it top to bottom that the top will be proven by the things below, so to speak. It is actually a questioning of that relationship. Or rather, in how that relationship works. Think about fractality. The bigger details are coming from the smaller, but not in the usual way of agglomeration or adding or quantity. Scale invariance. Scale invariance is a very helpful tool in understanding how you work yourself. I have many examples on that, and one is this. How on earth could the Alexandrian directions help me with my, my intellectual work, my thinking process, to make my thinking clearer? Scale invariance. And if you don't look into this with scale, I don't think that understanding will be possible at all. It ju will, will just be something repeated. It could be a problem there with Julian Barber. So many people repeat what he says, but doesn't really themselves look into it, which is hard. But it needs to be done needs to be done anyway. It's your thinking, not his thinking. You are the one doing the thinking and the interaction of the world. You need to look into these things. This is a bit what affordances are saying. Not Maybe not in that coarse words. words. <laughs> not in that sharp tone. <laughs> no, it's in a happier tone. Gibson is benevolent. He is definitely the voice of the friend. But the voice of the friend is a good example. And I will get back to that later. Not in this lecture, but it is extremely helpful. A top to bottom example I will give, and I, I'm not sure it's an absolutely good example, and I've given it before, but it could give you a hint if you don't take it too serious. 
or too deeply, I would say. And that is the Hippocratian medicine. Have you been to Kos? Go up the hill and you will see the palaces and the gardens of Hippocrate. He had, or we had when we read his hair, which is more correct, an idea of top bottom. And everything had to be first understood as these different humors, like gall and blood and so, so forth. And everything has had to be sort of explained that in that way. And not the finer details going up, not both ways, just one way. And that very strict, only non deconstructed take on the whole thing made it impossible for us to interact in a healthy way with the outside. A lot of things were excluded and also understanding was excluded for centuries, millennia. And this we know, that stalled Western medicine made it impossible for new things to enter until the very day the Hippocratian medicine crumbled and it was no longer this top to bottom of the Hippocratian kind but I would say there is a new top to bottom going on and what affordances could have done with Hippocratian top to bottom was opening it up a bit and to say that Look, there are some things coming from the bottom up. Look here. We can have uh, another view of bloodletting when you're suffering from lack of blood, anemia. Don't bloodlet them. People die. So, and that will strengthen the whole theory. You can have another way of going about things. You can start at the bottom also. And that will strengthen the other one. So one of the limitations is how we as a reader or medical practitioner, patients perceive the world or our take on it is in itself limiting and affordances can open that up. There is no exclusion about having a theory like the Hippocratian medicine. It did have such benefits. But deconstruction and going inside Hippocratian medicine would, would or would have made it more lenient, flexible, deeper, more complex, more helpful and open to experience. That's an opening up to seeing sort of the specifics of reality. And one of those specifics is still to this day, don't bloodlet when you're suffering from anemia. That would make the thing worse, really worse. You see, reality has its rule, but preemptively drawing up the rules and trying reality uh, to sort of succumb or bend down to the rules could be too harsh a method. And this is not the goal of affordances. And this is what makes it so utterly different. But therein lies also its great benefits for us. And I would say it's making incredible thinking processes possible by opening up theories on this strictness. This is a little bit, I can give you a third hint here, uh, it's a little bit like loosening up or softening out this thing we mentioned three, four hundred lectures ago when we talk about Graham Priest and making it possible to have a third thing both uh, not and 
is. Both her being and non-being don't not having an exclusion there. Exclusion there. Helpful because we avoid explosion. That's the negative take, but there is also a positive side to the whole thing without being uh, uh, over simpl not trying to simplify it. But the positive thing is it makes for much more possibilities. So it's an opening up to more ways of thinking. And also, oddly enough, uh, paraconsistent logic. It's in a way much stricter than the old logic. But that's a strictness that we couldn't see from the perspective of a classical logic, I'd say. I couldn't see it. I'd say it would be very hard to see that. In the first take, you will feel that for a consistent logic is rule less, having less rules, being less strict. But then you realize, oh no, it's actually stricter, but in a more defined, I would say more interactive way. You notice that I'm putting down my coffee cup, and if I were, so to speak, uh, of uh, the Hippocratian fashion, uh, maybe I had this top to bottom theory of all tables are being squared, therefore my cup would slide on the side and fall to the ground and letting coffee, coffee ooze out. Do I need to question uh, the theory of squareness of table or could I sort of go into the details without making the first rule something I have to make exceptions to? That's flexibility, that's an affordance. Look, we don't need to change the original idea of table squareness. And I would say if you're a classical physicist or an analytical phil philosopher, you would just gasp and say, oh my God, don't even dare to think the thing. No, we need to change the top. Need to have in the top an allowance for square table. That will sort of deny reality of my cup falling underneath. It will put the emphasis a little bit too much on theory and not so much on reality because it's been the indira interaction with reality which I just made that the cup falls, not in the theory. That's a hint as well. And now when we look at scale invariance, we can make the jump to say that the whole can actually show the little things. Also something that is partly excluded from possibility in the old ways of being. You see how somehow this is not a stance coming from a theoretical framework. It works within the framework. It's a stance within the framework. It's a stance, so to speak, in rather in doing. And you can do different things. But scale invariance, it's discovering a deeper scale that doesn't work in that regulated fashion that we normally think it does within ourselves. And that fourth and very important point. It is not just looking outwards and it's not just looking inwards. And that, I would say, takes a lot more explanation and I will end the lecture with that. So, 
you got my take in the beginning of this lecture and I will end with examples coming from the Gibsonian way of doing it. So I went the other way this way. I went from bottom to top this way. But scale indifference does go for does goes for theories as well. Doesn't just go for time and space, does just also goes for theories. And I'd say when it becomes more adjusted to the real thing, it will be a more working theory. And this is something that is clearly expounded by Gibson himself and Tony Shimeri for that matter as well. And I would argue later on that that is also the point of Jacques Derrida, Martin Heidegger, Levinas to some extent. It is taking the surroundings into the picture in a most practical way, one could say. But you see how the concepts works in your head. That's being practical in your head. I don't know if that makes sense, but this is what it is about. One could say, in a very simplified way, that the old way of looking at things all awareness is in the head and the environment doesn't have awareness and therefore it doesn't play any part when it comes to awareness understanding nor thinking our thinking is absolutely separated from reality a sort of a way that James Locke would have looked at it that properties are part of the perceiving subject to some extent and the objects have only a few properties and some of those properties are actually indirectly defined of James Locke's own theory telling the world that it has length, width and depth in the Cartesian way. This is not my criticism here but it should be duly noticed. And this is most definitely a theory that could be deepened, deepened down and understood more clearly. Instead, one does not have to take away the properties uh, like it would be in the regular reductive way of looking at theory. And instead, you can see that we can have two, a working principle and a participation in the very understanding of James Locke himself. So how he used it without just looking at the theory. Well we can't really exactly know how he used it or can we? Well I, I would say affordances oddly enough suggest a possibility for the latter. And that is one of those things that makes it so amazingly interesting. He can sort of understand the thinking he has by thinking ourselves in the same manner he did. And all of a sudden, the lock intake can become a bottom to top and a top to bottom then. Because there is always a coupling going on. We cannot to some extent say that thinking of James Locke was completely invalid. We can rather look into how he thought by thinking the same thing. And this is a most amazing idea. And I realized that can be done. And all of a sudden you can try it on and see how the thinking goes when you try it on, on, on the world. Can my idea that the thermos can be drank out of directly, could that actually work? Well, it can. This clearer coupling will make for a stronger use of words and a stronger thinking. 
all of a sudden thinking is not detached from the world and by looking into how we could deepen the thinking the connection try it out be more specific not putting the cup outside of the circle table that specificness in my hand movement my body movement and thinking are to some degree the very same thing nothing is theory independent but neither nothing is reality independent either not even theory not even thinking not even how the theory is constructed and we usually and this could be the fifth and most strongest point usually we assume that theories are from some other world in the sense that uh, the very material how we put the things together in the theory is otherworldly they apply for the world but the very material they're made of the theory itself a theory is actually an affordance and then in some sense it's out there already always already in the world isn't that rather amazing nothing gets lost in this this sort of hints to an idea that quantum mechanics works within classical physics as when you read the text you don't have to change the text but you can go deeper into it and read more carefully and all of a sudden it gives so much more it's an invitation to investigate further your understanding deepening your understanding so that's my hints and I'll go into the text I started with the other day uh, written by Andreas Garantino affordances explained Here we have it and we took off last lecture somewhere around the corner about these gestalt psychologists of the 1930s both named Kurt, Kurt Levin and Kurt Kofka and how they sort of see letter mailing as a demand character Gibson indicated to be graspable for instance like the cop an object must have opposite surfaces separated by distance less than span of a hand it's an odd way of telling it but it's correct the properties that ground the threats and promises associated with the affordances bearers will have to be studied by a new ecological physics ecological in the sense that the environment comes in the explananda of which are perception action couplings uh, coupled performed by organisms in environment some gibsonians take the relevant physical properties to be relations between sizes of the body and sizes of the affordance bearer but it's clear it is not the only preliminary step in attempt to ground affordances into the physical world it's just the first step as I will argue in the next section an item X is graspable relative to O in virtue of O's ability to grasp X and such ability does not consist merely of the surfaces and O span of the hand and even a paralyzed person do have those properties named but he can still not grasp uh, a 
I continue 952. In this paper, I remain neutral on the issue of whether affordances really are dispo disposition dispositional properties and that they are subjective in the sense of response dependent, that those properties only come into life or presencing when I am about, for instance, here, or an animal is about on the lawn. Or it is rather that the basis of such properties that they are objective in a certain sense. I just remark that however we settle the ontological dispute, affordances represent a significant novelty with respect to the standard Lockean tripartition between primary, secondary and tertiary qualities. Before turning to the clarification of the dispositional nature of affordances, we need to focus on the relation to perception. Here are two relevant quotes on the matter. First, places, attached objects, objects and substances are what are mainly perceived together with events, which are changes of these things. To perceive these things is to perceive what they afford. The meaning or value of a thing consists of what it affords. And I quote. The crucial empirical hypothesis of ecological psychology is that affordances are perceivable since affordances constitute, as claimed in the second quote, ecological meanings or value. The crucial hypothesis can be reformulated by saying that ecological meanings values are perceivable. For example, to perceive the ecological meaning of a fire would mean to perceive the fire as cook with able or burning by able. For Gibson, to perceive is to pick up information for purposes of behavioral discrimination. And that is rather than for purposes of beliefs, belief fixation. Gibson emphasizes emphasize that this pick up results from active exploration of environment, that it sometimes occur without the accompaniment of sense impressions, end of quote. And that is, that is always accompanied, accompanied by perception of one's own body, proprioception, my body here. Actually, quote from 1966, the, the year I was born. But how do organisms pick up information? To pick up information, argued Gibson, is to become attuned to invariants and disturbances that specified to be perceived properties. An intuitive understanding of these technical notions is the following. An invariant is a property of the structure of ambient energy arrays, parenthesis, e.g. the optic array, the acoustic array, etc., and a parenthesis, instated when relative to some, some source of change, such as moving point of observation or a moving source of illumination, the structure is left unchanged in a way that is typical of the item specified. Parenthesis E, G, a reflectance can specify the substance coal by being unchanged in the way characteristics of coal substances. And a parenthesis.
A disturbance is a property of the structure of ambient energy arrays instantiated when relative to some source of change. Parenthesis. The change constituted by an approaching predator. End of parenthesis. The structure presents a pattern of change that is typical of the item specified. Parenthesis. E.g. the counter of an a contour of an animal can specify the event approaching predator by changing in the way typical approaching pre predators. End of parenthesis. In general term, to say that affordances are perceivable is to say that there are invariants and disturbances in ambient energy arrays that specify the threats and promises of items in the environment. For example, to say that the eatability of a given apple is perceivable or that the being hit by ability of a flying ball is perceivable is to say that there is sensory appearance, a way to be visible, audible, tangible, orderous, tasteable, that is typical respectively of apples affording eating and of flying balls affording being hit by. Gibson was very clear that we cannot establish a, a priori what affordances are specified in ambient energy. Very good point there. As he puts it, the central question for the theory of affordances is not whether they exist and are real, but whether information is available in ambient light for perceiving them. Information is available for perceiving all and only those offerings of the environment that are associated with typical sensory appearances. In some cases, the organism will have to learn to perceive a perceivable affordance, that is, learn to become attuned to the invariant or disturbance specif specifying it. What invariants and disturbances are, in fact, available for specification or of affordances will have to be established by empirical investigation. The most controversial part of ecological psychology has to do with the way in which Gibsonian cash out the notion of becoming attuned to invariants and disturbances. On the one hand, they assume that invariants and disturbances carry information about affordances by lawful, lawfully specifying them. The idea is that a law of nature links properties of the structure of ambient energy presence ambient energy arrays and affordances. On the other hand, Gibsonians think that the presence of a lawful specification is such that the assimilation of information for affordances can occur without the involvement of mental representation and mental processes involving representations, e.g. in inferences, computations, retrievals of our memories. We spoke about that a lot. I would actually take that off later on here. This is what lies behind the trademark claim of ecological psychologists that perception is direct. And this is one of the most troublesome things. What is direct perception? Well, let's start with memory. Memory is thought about generally as being something of the past and stored somewhere. This is not the take on the Gibsonian way.
memory is an affordance and you investigate it, so to speak. It's a source and you can use it. So it's not a detached thing within yourself, in your memory bank, that doesn't have some connection to you. The usual theory says there is no connection at all between memory and yourself. Of course, they do mean that the memories in wind are in within you, but they have no connection to you, so to speak. This is different. They are just like a computer memory. So you take them out and you look at them and then you see, oh, that has something to do with me. No, 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 says Gibson. This is not how it actually works. Nothing in the world works that way. So, although this sounds like a counter-argument, this is something you can try out for yourself. Look at it more carefully. How do we interact with things in the world? And for my take, I think it makes a good sense to assume, or you can even realize, oh my God, memories, that must be working the same thing with, like all other things I interact with. It can't be of a different nature, so to speak. And then you go into it, you notice this is actually how you do memory. And in a way, memories are presently here. They are directly perceived, not indirectly, by be taken out of the archive, going down into the corridors of the UB on your skates, uh, which used to be the case in UB, the university library, taking the book out, putting it into the elevator, and send it up to the reception and give it into the loan taker. This is how we saw memory earlier on, and Gibson does not agree. It's never parted somehow. Memories are never parted. And I can, we can have some arguments here, because arguments, I think they can help initially, as long as you don't take them to, to be like firmly established. More like a slap on the cheek to think more. But see, memories are always created in interaction. How come? they later on are supposed to be objective and stored in the archive. They are of interactive nature from the beginning, and therefore I would say it's just to claim they always will be interactive. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a value. They wouldn't work. They wouldn't have any strength to them. There would be any prana or key to them. They will be meaning, they will be meaningless, not being as stern decisive, bearing, good for you. Telos is slowly coming back with Gibsonian, not because the theory has a telos, but there is a telos in the things we do. And I think that's the best way to conclude this lecture. There is a telos already present in what we do. And this is what we discover by looking deeper and deeper into affordances. And it helps everything. It's not possible for nothing to be helped, not helped by this. It's helping everything. Uh, I think time to end there. I'll say thank you very much for your patience. And I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. And I will end by having a look at this blood oak. It's so beautiful. And see the colors. They are absolutely full. You can look into movies and the one they want to have more colors, they usually create an artificial rain and put water on the streets. Do you get both more color, more reflection, and an ambience that is almost unbeatable?